Welcome to Pilgrim Church, United Church of Christ, at 25 South Main Street in Sherburne, Massachusetts. For those who are here, for those who are watching at home, and for those who will be watching later this week, maybe on YouTube, we're just really glad to, um, to have you with us. And so I'm happy to report that no pipes froze this week, uh, no walls cracked. It was kind of a quiet week, uh, and very, very grateful for that. Um, I said it last week, but I want to say again how um, grateful I am and how I would invite all of us to be grateful for all the volunteers who have stepped forward to kind of make sure that we were able to pivot relatively quickly from upstairs to down here. Um, and the lesson that uh, I talked to the kids about last week is that church is really not a building. Church is a people. And so wherever two or more are gathered in Christ's name, um, that's where church happens. And sometimes it happens in a building, and sometimes it doesn't happen in a building. Um, but that said, it, I'm really happy that you are in church today and that you are church today. 
Uh, some updates. Uh, this week, we hope to pull all of the old radiators out of the sanctuary and to actually accept delivery of some new radiators. We're going to try to be back in the sanctuary by March 5th, but has anybody here ever worked with contractors on home repairs? And so we'll see. Uh, and until then, we will be down here. Uh, you know, if you want after church, grab a cup of coffee and take a wander upstairs if you want to see kind of what happened. It's kind of really fascinating uh, in a scary kind of way. Um, and so I just invite you to do that. But uh, again, I'm just really grateful to have um, all of you here today. And I really only have one announcement this morning. Um, we are moving into the season of Lent. I'm going to talk a that, about that a bit more in um, uh, my children's sermon today, but there's just two things I want to remind you of is, you know, we've had this longstanding 25-plus uh, year relationship with Bethel AME Church, which is the largest black church in Boston, and we have committed during Lent, we always get together, and so for the first service in Lent, which begins on Ash Wednesday, Wednesday, they come here and worship with us. And Pastor Gloria will be preaching, and we'll have ashes, and we have healing prayers. It's a beautiful service. And then on Maundy Thursday of Holy Week, we go into Boston. And often the confirmation class comes, too. There's several confirmants here this morning. Um, and so um, I want to invite you to come this Wednesday night, 730, for our Ash Wednesday service. It, I'm, I'm, I'm biased, but it's a beautiful service. Um, and if you've never heard Pastor Gloria preach, you should definitely be here because she's a wonderful preacher. And then the second thing, if you want to start your day off nice and early and get ashes, I'm going to be standing in line. I do this. This is like the fourth year in a row I've done it. I'm going to be at the Dunkin' Donuts standing in the drive through line beginning at 6.30 on Wednesday morning, and I'll be out there probably for about an hour and a half giving ashes to people who want it, uh, offering prayers for people who want it, and just kind of witnessing uh, for God's love in the world. And so if you want to swing by on your way to work, um, I would absolutely love to see you. And I, I, like, um, I like plain donuts and a medium, hot, with two creams and one sugar. No, it's funny. Every year, someone drives around. They ask me what I want, and they drive all the way around, and then they bring it back to me. So, nicest people. So, um, but, uh, and after uh, our worship today, you are invited to kind of, stay and um, join us for coffee and for fellowship. And so at this time, I invite you to join together and to turn left, right, back, or front and to greet each other with a sign of God's peace. <laughs> I'm a member of the choir, and I've done a bunch of other things around here over the years. Um, but I'd like to welcome you, especially on this beautiful, beautiful February morning. So our call to worship this morning is in your hymnal on the back, page 536. It's page 536, not hymn number. Page 536, and it's going to be reading number 105. We will read it responsively. I will start, and you will reply. It's page 536. Not him. Page 536. Way, way in the back. Yeah. The very bottom of the page, it says 536. And then it'll be reading number 105, which is in the bottom corner down here. And it's based on Psalm 136. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. O oh, give thanks to the Lord of God, the God of gods. O oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords. To him who alone does great wonders, to him by understanding 
made the heavens to him who spread out the earth upon the waters. To him who made the great lights, the sun to rule over the day, the moon and stars to rule over the night. To him who smote the firstborn of Egypt and brought Israel out from among them with a strong hand and an outstretched arm. To him who led his people through the wilderness, to him who smote the great kings and gave their land as a heritage to Israel his servant. It is he who remembered us in our lowest state and rescued us from our foes. He who gives food to all flesh. O oh, give thanks to the Lord of heavens, for his steadfast love endures forever. I was working on a, a blog post and column a couple weeks ago and did some research and and um, on all of the streaming services that I have and on cable TV, I have access to 21,000 television shows and to 18,000 movies. And I can never figure out what to watch. And if I'm like an average American nowadays, I spend about seven and a half hours online. 
which if you think about it, if you're sleeping eight hours a night, that's, that's kind of overwhelming. Um, and I know I do it sometimes because I just don't know what else to do. Or I feel uncomfortable with kind of the quiet, you know what I mean, with the silence, uh, because we're just not used to it. And so what I would invite us to think about today as we kind of come into a time of quiet prayer is, is where in your life might you need a little more of God's quiet and silence, um, especially as we kind of stand on the edge of, of Lent. Where is God's kind of perfect silence needed in your life? And so let's bow our heads and uh, open our hearts and listen and talk silently to our God. You who are holy, you who invite us to be still and to know you, encourage us, God, to create more spaces for quiet and silence in our lives. Move us um, to move beyond, at times, virtual reality, but reality. Help us to lift our heads up on a regular basis from our screens and look at your beautiful creation. And also be aware of people around us uh, in need of connection and relationship. And so we ask you to, um, to do all these things. And we do it with confidence and with thanksgiving in the name of the one who, who prepared for his time in ministry by going away and invites us all to pray together as a sign of our unity in him. Our about as close as it can get. I can't get any closer than this, guys. Okay? So I'm just kind of trusting that we'll figure it out. Um, so I was going to invite two of the young people here to come forward, but I'm going to let you sit in your seats. Uh, and we're all going to just talk about uh, one thing today. I'd like to ask you, first of all, can any of you kind of tell me what Lent means? What do you know about it? What have you heard about it? I know in some Protestant circles, actually, they don't, they don't kind of celebrate Lent. I remember the first time I, I went to, my first call was in Glastonbury, Connecticut at a congregational church, and they didn't have Ash Wednesday. And so I went to the senior pastor, and I said, can we have Ash Wednesday? And he said, yep, if you want to run the service, you can. And the first thing the deacons asked was, we're not like those Catholics, are we? So, um, so, what's Lent, anybody? Okay, well maybe we aren't like those Catholics. Barbara? So it's preparation. It's a time of preparation. What else? It recognizes the 40 days that Jesus spent in the wilderness. So we'll read a passage next Sunday that talks about Jesus going into the desert for 40 days to prepare himself for his public ministry. Okay, 
Anyone know why that number 40 is important? That's how long um, the uh, Israelites wandered in the desert. Um, and uh, wilderness is really um, anywhere that is not a comfortable or a, a familiar place. And so the other thing about Lent is we're invited to kind of go deeper spiritually. Um, and the ashes are just a sign of our mortality. Does everybody know what, what I say when I'm graveside at a service? Ashes to ashes and dust to dust. So Ash Wednesday is really just a reminder of our mortality as human beings and of our need to depend upon God. And that's it. Um, so uh, I just want to invite all of you in any way that you want to to kind of enter into our Lenten celebration. We have a lot of things going on. Um, I'm going to be doing a preaching series on kind of what it means for us as human beings and as a church and maybe even as a world to, as we emerge from the wilderness of COVID, have we learned anything? Um, and I'll be preaching on that, and then we'll also have discussion sessions as well. And so what I am going to suggest is uh, there's child care for second grade and below, or you're welcome to stay in the sanctuary. So whatever you'd like to do. Um, so I would invite uh, Marilyn to come forward at this time and to read our scripture for the day. This is 1 to 9. This is the story of Jesus' transfiguration. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother, John, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became bright as light. Suddenly, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will set up three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And then they raised their eyes. They saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Here ends the reading for this morning. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. So I pour water onto a paper towel. It was a trick that Carol Marple taught me. It's how um, I move the paper. Otherwise, my fingers are a little bit too dry. Before I pray and we move into the uh, sermon this morning, uh, I just want to point out a couple of things about the text itself. So this is a pretty familiar story, the story of the transfiguration of Jesus going to the mountaintop. Um, it appears in three of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so what that means when that happens is we as readers need to pay attention. Because some stories only are in one gospel or maybe two. And so clearly, the authors are trying to make a very important point here, so important that when the Bible is pulled together, this story ended up in three of the gospels. And then the second thing is, is that a mountaintop is a very familiar place. In particular, if you were um, an ancient Israelite and you heard the story, who's the person that you think about, about the mountaintop? Moses. You think about Moses, okay? Um, and so let's be in a spirit of prayer together. Let us pray. 
God, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts, let them be acceptable in your sight. Amen. And again, from that text, Jesus led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. His clothes became as white as the light. Then a bright cloud covered them. And a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am very well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. Let's be in a spirit of prayer. God, open our ears that we might hear you. Open our hearts that we might be moved by you and open our lives that, that we might live in your ways. Amen. God, grant me the wisdom to accept the things I cannot change, the things I cannot control, too. His name is Dylan. He is the closest I will probably ever come to having a son of my own. He is the son of very good friends of mine, and from the year 2000 until the year he went away to college, I had dinner, and still do, at that family's supper table almost every single Monday night for 18 years, which means I probably ate something like a thousand meals with Dylan. He's a good young man. He's smart and funny and caring. And as with all the young people in my life, I only want the best for him. And I certainly do not want to see him hurt or suffer Though I also know it is impossible to shield him or to shield any of my loved ones from harm and the realities of life. We can't save loved ones from broken hearts or broken bodies, from dreams deferred or dreams never met. We can't control their lives somehow, you know, have them live in a protected bubble. Nor can we, I'd say, control most of our lives most of the time, but more on that later. I want to tell you a story. It happened last September 28th and 29th, to be exact. Now, Dylan graduated from Sewanee University last May with a degree in English and theater, and his first job out of school was and is with the Florida Repertory Theater in Fort Myers. Yes, that Fort Myers. And last September, Hurricane Ian, the fourth most powerful storm ever recorded, hit that town, and Dylan was right in the middle of it. Because of the fast-shifting nature of Ian, Dylan was in a non-evacuation zone until he wasn't in a non-evacuation zone, but by then it was too late to leave. And so Dylan and two of his roommates spent one very, very scary day and night in their second floor apartment in Fort Myers. Now we spoke a little, but we had to limit our communications to texts to save power on his phone. And so me, nine o'clock in the morning, do you have a safety plan, a place to shelter? I need you to be careful, love you. Dylan, yeah, we're watching the storm and we will evacuate to the other coast if we need to, this is before they knew they couldn't evacuate. Me, now I'm worried. I had assumed you were evacuated. Dylan, we're not in the evac zone, so we're waiting out the storm. I will keep you posted. Now, one of the reasons I was worried, and you saw it on the news, was when Ian made landfall with a direct hit on Fort Myers, there were sustained winds of over 120 miles an hour for more than eight hours. I mean, think about that. 12.44 p.m., me, how you doing, Dylan? What's the weather? Dylan, howling winds right now. Me, do you have enough food and water? Are you concerned? Dylan, not too concerned. I got plenty of supplies. And so it continued all afternoon and then evening. I kept texting him, and he kept texting me back. Dylan hunkered down in his apartment by candlelight through hours and hours of those 100-mile-per-hour winds. And then the next morning, this text exchange. Me, how was the night? 
How are you? Dylan, it's bright and shiny. I'm doing well overall. Dylan, I've already been out to get coconuts that fell from the trees. Me, kind of like Gilligan's Island. Dylan, yes, me. I am so happy you are OK. I was worried. Love you. Now, the only thing I could control that long night when I was so worried about Dylan, as were his parents and so many others, all we could do was to pray and to stay connected to him. He had to go through that storm on his own. And nothing, no one could stop that hurricane. And no one, my friends, nothing, at least in the mortal realm, can control a hurricane. And I'd say almost all of the rest of this life, too. And as a Christian and as a human, this continues to be one of the hardest of spiritual lessons to learn. Even though it is tempting to think, well, if I only have more money, or if I only was smarter, or if I only had more power, or if only I was stronger, well, then I could be in control. And yet, I have to tell you, always life has proved me wrong. I am not in control. Now, the apostles certainly learned about a lack of control and a loss of control in today's fantastical gospel story, the tale of the transfiguration. Jesus takes Peter and James and John up a mountain one day. This is the same trio that will later follow Christ to the Garden of Gethsemane. And yes, fall asleep. Peter, James, and John were kind of like Jesus's inner circle. I suppose along with Mary Magdalene at other times. But this day, those three uh, apostles, along with Jesus, they got to that mountaintop. It was a hill, more than likely, in Galilee, north of Jerusalem. And they were literally just taking a hike up a hill until we read and hear that somehow Jesus was transformed and transfigured before their eyes. And he was speaking to the spirits of Elijah, the greatest prophet in the Old Testament, and Moses, the greatest leader, in some kind of waking vision, or maybe even a waking dream, for Peter and James and John. And then Peter, God love him, who is like the goofiest apostle, always seems to do the inappropriate thing, but the loving thing, God love him. Peter acts very compulsively, as he often does, and he suggests enthusiastically well, let's make three tents. We'll make three dwelling places. It's almost like he wants to build three monuments to contain this miracle, to control what he is witnessing, to tame the untamable, to capture that which ultimately could never be captured. He means well. And then human control is lost completely when a cloud rolls over the mountain and God God speaks aloud for only one of the two times that God does so in the New Testament, telling of God's love for Jesus and directing the apostles with one command. Listen to him. Listen to him. And then it was over. Talk about an out-of-control event. It was almost like a divine hurricane, God breaking into the world. And even though Peter means well, and trying to rein in and admire this visible manifestation of God, which is often called a theophany. For me, one of the gospel's lessons here is clear. God is in control here. Not those humans. Maybe not even Jesus, in a way. God sets the stage, and then God speaks. God is the overarching authority and power here, not any human power. I believe that was the hard lesson the apostles, especially Peter, learned in today's wild gospel story. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot control. Ultimately, my friends, I believe that we can control just three things in life. Three things. How we live and how we treat others. How we love ourselves and how we love God. And that's it. We can control how we carry ourselves in the world, our behavior. We can be aware of how our actions affect others and then take full responsibility for our lives. 
We can work to treat others and ourselves with care and respect. We can truly love ourselves in a healthy way. We can honor our bodies and our souls and how wonderfully God makes us. And we can choose to love God with all our heart and with all our mind and with all our strength and with all our soul, which, of course, reflects what? The golden rule. You know, I've run a middle school camp for years, and we have T-shirts, and it kind of sums up the whole Bible in three verses. Love God, love others, love self. That's not hard to teach to children or to adults. Love God, love others, love self. That we can control. The rest, I believe, is beyond our final control. I'm curious what you would think about that. To me, everything else it's, is out of our control. I can't make someone like or love me. I can't force people to do what I want them to do, no matter how hard I try. I mean, have you ever tried negotiating with a toddler? I can't tell an addict or an alcoholic that they must stop using. I can't control larger forces either, except for my small part in them. I can't control a hurricane or how it threatens people. We can't control a pandemic and how it shuts down a world and changes things forever. A good friend of mine this week was reminded that she can't control her professional life when she was laid off by a high-tech firm. There was nothing that she could do. But thank God that I believe, and maybe you too, I trust that somehow a power greater than myself, the power and the reality of God, this is what holds the universe and all of life together somehow. God is in and through and above and below and beyond and at the center of creation. And yes, at the highest of levels, God is in control. Control, not me, not you. I don't mean to say that God moves human beings around um, their lives like pieces on a chessboard, no. God also gives us free will. And I don't think that God blows the winds of hurricane. That is natural law, which is a force unto itself. And yet, I trust somehow that God, in this life, in my life, that God is the director, and I am just another player on the stage. And that is a good thing to remember. It's like God saying to you and to me, Relax. You don't have to be or to feel responsible for everything. You don't have to feel responsible for everyone, John. That's my job. You just do what you can do. Oh, and also, listen to Jesus. Listen to him. Or friends, we can remember some prayers to say a few that, for me, really sum up the paradox of control in this life. Now, I've said this one to you many times, and I'll say it again. It's my favorite prayer. Dear God, you are God. I am not. Thank God. If we all prayed that every single day, we would live much happier lives. Or, of course, God grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change, courage to change the things we can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Now, that is a slightly altered excerpt from the 1941 Serenity Prayer written by the theologian Reinhold Niebuhr and first prayed as a prayer at a little congregational church in the western Massachusetts hill town of Heath. That prayer, my friends, at least for me, sums up both the human dilemma of control and the God-given reality of God's control in this life. I believe in life we do our best with God to discern what we cannot change or control. And then we ask God for the bravery and the spirit to work on the things we do have control over, mostly ourselves. And then with wisdom, we give the rest over to God. So, may God grant us all serenity. Serenity. Let all God's people say,
Please be seated. So can you hear me relatively well? Okay, good. It's one of the advantages of being down here. Um, the first thing I wanted to ask, since we're a little, uh, I don't know, I, I like to think that sometimes we can be a little less formal. What's your response to this notion that we're not in control and that God's in control? So Carol says, thank goodness. Um, but what else? Is this like a lesson that's important for you that you've learned? How do you respond to that? Anybody? You need to be reminded of that again and again. Any other thoughts or ideas? Uh, Bob. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Kind of surprise. Or it can, you can react with fear. You know, it's kind of pretty natural. You know, I just think of like, I don't know, maybe it's because I'm getting a little older, but just even health. You really you don't know. But you can either be like in fear of that or you can just try to live the best you can every single day and thank God for life. And, and your body's going to do what your body's going to do. So I just think it's a, it's a good lesson for all of us to learn. It's certainly a good lesson for me to learn. So um, we, can dis uh, we can continue this discussion at some point, but I wanted to go into our, our time of prayer. I want to pray for Phoebe Yasa, who just continues to struggle with with ill health, who's, but who's still at home and who still is kind of fighting and feisty, and, and she appreciates all of your cards and your phone calls. I got news from the Plimptons this week. You know, they moved to the Cape. They were former members of ours, but their son, Hollis, is having pretty serious back disc surgery this week, and she asked us to lift up Hollis in our prayers. Uh, I want to just pray for the other members of our church who... Um, are at home most of their lives, and especially Jean Given. Uh, for those of you who know her, any way that you can reach out to her and connect with her, I know that would make a big difference. Prayers for Jean Rosso. I went to see her this week. She's a longtime member of our church. Uh, she was diagnosed six years ago with stage four lung cancer, and she has um, survived and even in some ways thrived since then, but it's kind of finally caught up with her, and she's in hospice, and so please say a prayer for her and for her daughter, Laura, and that whole family as they kind of surround her with love. And then just a couple of others. Uh, I want to offer just prayers for all those who struggle with drugs or alcohol. You know, during the pandemic, one of the things that happened is alcohol and drug use, it went through the roof. And the number of drug overdoses in the United States is highest than it has ever been. And so we kind of struggle with that. And I want to lift up that as a prayer. And then the other thing I would like to lift up as a prayer is just all those people, especially young people who are struggling from a mental health perspective. Because the other thing that's a reality is, is um, the rate of suicide, especially among younger people, is, is uh, it's huge. And so at some point in the spring, with um, a couple of other people in the church, um, hoping to offer some kind of gathering for parents of adolescents to come together and to talk about these things. And actually, maybe we'll even invite you know, parents of older children. I just feel like parents need a lot of support, especially if their kids are struggling with mental health issues. And so if you're actually interested in helping me with that, why don't you just let me know after church? And so are there any uh, prayers, people, concerns, gratitudes that people would like to offer? Anyone? Yes, Frank. Uh, prayers for Gloria, Pastor Gloria uh, White Hammond, her brother Wilbur passed away after uh, um, being in hospice, but not for that long. So thank you, Frank. Joys and concerns. Yes, Beth. So Beth offers prayers of thanksgiving for all the support 
and kind words people have offered to her and to Frank as their daughter and their granddaughter both go through some serious health concerns. That's why we haven't seen Beth for a while. She's been uh, down in Maryland uh, helping out. So um, we will definitely um, lift them up in prayer, continuing Beth. Any other names or concerns that people would like to lift up at this time? Yes. So a uh, prayer that uh, for a young person kind of be granted a reset or a do-over as they seek to kind of find equilibrium and peace in their own uh, mental health. I mean, I would just offer prayers for kids and for parents this week that they have a great time, that they go away and they ski or they watch a bunch of movies or they sleep late every day or whatever they need to do to just kind of come together uh, and, to, um, and to be fed spiritually. Yes, Peter. Okay, so for Margie Freeman, who is known to some people in this church, she's just struggling with uh, getting older. Any other joys or concerns? All right, let's be in a spirit of prayer together. Let us pray. God, in ways that we do not understand, but in ways that we seek to trust, you are the author of all life and all creation. You were before anything was. And you will be after everything is gone. Your eternity. And yet you come to us in a person, in Jesus Christ, to show us of unconditional love and welcoming love and forgiving love. Remind us of that, God, especially when we feel out of control in our own lives, to have the humility to turn things over to you and the wisdom to know we can't control everything no matter how hard we try, God. We ask your prayers and blessings on all the things that we've spoken out loud today and on all the prayers that we hold in our hearts. And now in the quiet places of our hearts, hear our prayers this day. All of these things and so much more we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Let all God's people say, Amen. So there's just two uh, things I want to point out before we go into our offering. The first is um, uh, we have several members of our confirmation class here today, and it's just great to see you. I hope you guys have great vacations too. And then um, last week in my sermon, I talked about um, kind of being grateful and how we had um, seen just a return of younger people and kids and how we, we kind of kept building on that, and then it finally happened. So Angie Johnson is here today. And so for three years, Angie kept at it on a lot of Sundays when there was no one here under 60 <laughs> or 50. And she put stuff on YouTube, and she put stuff on our web page. And though we lost you as our CE director, we're really grateful for your ministry, Angie. And it's absolutely wonderful to see you here today. So thank you. And so we return to a place like church uh, for safety, for wisdom, for challenge, for love, for prayers, and for community. And it happens in part because we make our commitments of time and talents and of money. And so it's in that spirit that we will receive this morning's offering.
God, we are thankful for this glorious day, for our many blessings, and this generous community of believers. Please guide us to use these gifts to be a blessing to this world and to further the holy mission of this church. We ask for these things in your glorious name. Amen. Amen. God, we pray this simple prayer as people have for so many years and trusted in it. God, grant us the serenity to accept the things that we cannot change, the courage to change the things we can, and the wisdom to know the difference. God, send us out into this world confident and trusting in you. Let everyone say, Amen. Amen. Amen.
take your uh, paper if you want.